the nation of Israel. Such a tiny little nation. How many days go past where this tiny little uh, country is not mentioned somewhere in the media? You see it on internet news boards, you hear of them on the radio, you see them on TV and in the newspaper, and they have now virtually become an integral part of the media. You might remember back to 2001 when the Trade Center Towers were destroyed in the United States of America. And Osama bin Laden made it very clear that the World Trade Center Towers were destroyed because of the support that America has for this tiny nation, Israel. And there has always been, ladies and gentlemen, this healthy hatred for this little country. And you can trace it back right through their history. And as we go through our lecture tonight, we will see that come through. But what we wish to show tonight, friends, is that this history of this little nation of Israel is a witness to the fact that their God is a living God, who is all wise, who is all knowledgeable, who is completely righteous, and on whom every human being can depend if he but obeys his commandments that he has laid down in his word. And you might wonder at the size of this little nation, friends. This little country that can fit in Austra inside Australia multiple times. It is so small on the map that the name has to be printed outside of its borders. And yet it is a country, ladies and gentlemen, that has the capacity not only to remain as a country for such a long period of time, but even after its demise, it's had the ability to revive itself again as a nation in its own right against incredible odds. And that is a miracle in itself. And when you stop and take a look to see what the Bible has to say about this little nation, you will completely understand why this little nation of Israel has been the focus of the Middle East. It is a nation, ladies and gentlemen, to which suffering comes second nature. Oppression is a part of life. And you can track the history of this little nation right back to before the times of Christ in the Bible. And when we discover some of their history a little later on, you will see why it is that they have suffered the way they have suffered. Why it is the oppression has come upon this nation. And why their whole history has been dominated by it. And what's all this leading to, friends? What has all this got to do with proving the existence of a living God? How does this show Israel to be a witness to the fact that God actually exists? That he is alive? And that he is actively ruling in the nations of men? Well, what we aim to do tonight is to prove to you that this tiny nation of Israel is in fact proof that there is a living God and that Israel is his witness. And all we have to do is look into this book. And when we do that, ladies and gentlemen, we will come to see the plan and purpose that God has with the earth. The plan that God has marked out for Israel. And we'll see that both in their history and in the future of Israel. And we'll see that it was actually predicted in the Bible. And we will also see the early history of Israel recorded. And we'll see that the same power that was behind Israel back in those times is the same power that was behind Israel in World War II. It is the same power that was behind this little nation in 1967. And it will be the same power that it will be behind this nation in the future age because of a promise that God has made. The very fact that Israel is here is testimony to the power that is behind their fate. You know, back in 1967, the Jews recaptured the land of Israel so quickly during the Six Day War in 1967. And when you consider those odds, 
one has to come to the conclusion that it was no ordinary war. Now, the Christadelphians, friends, as a community, do not, and I stress, do not condone what is happening in the Middle East today. We do not condone what Israel is doing on their part in the day-to-day -day atrocities that occur over there. We do not condone the tit-for-tat the tit for tat fighting that occurs on a regular basis, nor do we take sides on any party's uh, involvement in any conflict. But what we do do is we follow closely those events that take place as they unfold, and we take encouragement from that. We don't take encouragement from the inhumanity to man that goes on on a daily basis. But what we do take comfort from is that we can see the things predicted in the Bible coming to pass. And that encourages us. Because we can see the hand of a living God working in the nations around us. And so what we plan to do tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is we plan to look at the purpose that God has with the earth. We then want to have a look at the history of Israel. We want to have a look at the birth of Israel. We then want to have a look at Deuteronomy and at chapter 28, which is the reading we had tonight, and it contains the blessings and the cursings that, that had the capacity to come upon this nation of Israel, depending on what they did. And then we would like to have a look at what is going to come to pass in the future age and how that applies to both you and I. So when we come to look at the plan and purpose that God has with the earth, we come to Numbers chapter 14 and at verse 21. It is a portion of scripture or word of God that describes for us the plan and the purpose that that God has with the earth. And so we read in verse 21, for as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That is the ultimate goal that God has with this earth and mankind upon it. And you will notice in your Bible, if you have a King James Version of the Bible or otherwise commonly referred to as the authorised version, you will see that the words as there are in italics. And the reason they're in italics is because when the King James Version was translated into the English language, the translators put these little words in to try and help give the sense of what they thought the Hebrew was saying. And sometimes they got it right, sometimes they got it wrong. And in this case, those words are not actually in the original of the Bible. And so what we actually have, friends, is truly I live a far more definite statement of what God plans to do with this earth. He is swearing by the fact that he is a living God and that he actively works amongst the nations to bring about his purpose. Truly I live. All the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So the next question we have to ask is, how is God going to implement the plan of filling the whole earth with his glory? Well, come with me to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we read there in verse 26, where it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And when we think about that verse, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the conclusion that if we have dominion over the whole world, and all that is in it, then we have been created with a free will. Either to accept or to reject the word of God. And if we accept the word of God and believe it when we study it, it will tell us how we are to worship God properly. 
And when we worship him proper, properly, it is only then that we will know what his character is and it is only then that we can manifest it in our own lives. And when we do that, God will reward us with eternal life. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, we will have put on immortality. We become, as it were, vehicles to spread his glory throughout the whole earth. And that is how God will accomplish his ultimate goal of filling the earth with his glory or his character. Now, I just want you to keep those things in the back of your mind because this theme of free will will crop up a few times during this evening's lecture. You know, it was Israel's free will that brought upon them the cursings throughout their history and their blessings. And so God's ultimate goal is to fill the earth full of immortal beings that can manifest his glorious character. But today, ladies and gentlemen, as you look out throughout the world, the majority of mankind do not worship or obey God, let alone the Jews. And you can't say that the earth is filled with the glory of God when you have the Jews and the Palestinians popping one another off in so-called targeted assassinations. Neither can you have an earth filled with the glory of God when you've got wars going on like, like the one that we have going on currently in Syria. And so we know that the time when his glory will fill the earth has not yet come. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, just like us, the nation of Israel had this opportunity. They had the opportunity to manifest God's character or God's glory. But they rejected that opportunity. And it was to their own peril that they did so. They exercised their free will to reject the word of God. So how did this little nation come into existence? Well, firstly, come with me to a few pages over to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we read of what is referred to as the Abrahamic promise. You see, God had made a promise to the man Abraham, who was the father of the nation of Israel. Have a look at Genesis chapter 12, and we read in verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, or Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I want you to ask yourself these questions, ladies and gentlemen. Is the nation of Israel a great nation today? No, it is not. Is Abraham in the land today? No, he is not. Is he alive? No, he's quite dead. So this promise has not been fulfilled. But can we be sure of such a future? Undoubtedly. God has not only given his word to Abram, but has also provided a witness, which just happens to be of Abram's own lineage. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 43. In Isaiah chapter 43, and we read there in verse 10, it says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, speaking of the nation of Israel, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And so this tiny little nation of Israel is God's witness. The Jewish people are witness not only to God himself, but they are witness to his word, the Bible. The very preservation of this people, 
And the revival of the nation of Israel are clearly part of God's plan and purpose with the earth. And so why did the children of Israel suffer the demise that they suffered if they are truly the witness of God? Surely if they were God's witnesses, they would not have seen the demise that they saw, nor would they have suffered the suffering that they have endured either. But they did suffer and they did lose their sovereignty as a nation for a period of time. So why? Well, the main reason they suffered for so long is because they exercised their free will to refuse to believe God's word. And ladies and gentlemen, if you are to uh, have the privilege of being the witness of God, along with that comes huge responsibilities. And that being the responsibility of listening to him, obeying him and worshipping him. In fact, the climax of their unbelief is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 27. If you turn there for a moment to Matthew chapter 27. And we take up the record there in verse 22. Where we read, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed, before, bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You see, friends, the nation of Israel rejected the fact that Christ was their Messiah and King, so much so that they crucified him, God's only begotten Son. They had severed the only source of salvation available to them, and the only source of help that would have been given them had they turned to God and worshipped him in the way that he had appointed them. So let's have a look at the history of Israel and see how they are the witness of an eternal living God. And I'd like you to come with me to the reading we had this evening in Deuteronomy and at chapter 28. In this chapter we have the blessings and the cursings of Israel outlined. And on the overhead... I have a breakdown of the chapter into various subsections. And in the first 14 verses, we have the blessings in the land. In verse 15 to 24, we have the cursings in the land. In verses 25 to 35, we have the invasion and domination by foreigners. In verses 36 to 46, troubles continue back in the land. And verses 47 to 62, we have the invasion of Rome. And contained within Deuteronomy chapter 28, friends, are the prophecies concerning the history of this little nation. So let's have a look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 28, where it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So contained in that verse, ladies and gentlemen, and explained in more detail as we go on, is the criteria that they had to meet. They had to hearken to the word of God. And the word hearken there means to hear with the implication of obedience. 
If you wish to find out how I came to that meaning, I'm only too willing to show you at the conclusion of tonight's lecture. So it's not just to listen to the word of God and then forget about it. It is to hearken to the word of God and to obey it. And there is that theme running through again of being given a free will either to accept or to reject the word of God. So if they obeyed God, then all the blessings that are listed here would flow upon them as they did when they were under the leadership of Joshua. Just keep your hand in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. And in Joshua chapter 24... And at verse 31, we read these words. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And what were those things that God did for Israel? Well, turn back a page. And we can see in verse 5 that God sent Moses also and Aaron, and I, that is God, <coughs> plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. Verse 6, God brought their fathers out of Egypt. Verse 8, God brought them out into the land of the Amorites and gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land, and he destroyed them from before them. Verse 11, and they went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and God delivered them into their hand. Verse 12, and God sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. Verse 13, and I have given you a land for which ye did not labour, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, of vineyards and olive yards, <coughs> which ye planted not, do ye eat. <coughs> and all of those blessings are exactly what was prophesied would happen if they obeyed God. Coming back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. And they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. And that's exactly what happened. And it's recorded for us in Joshua chapter 24. And so then we come to the next section of the breakdown. Verses 15 to 24, which are the cursings in the land. And I just want you to note verses 15 through 19, where it says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. They are virtually word for word the exact opposite of the blessings contained in verses 3 to 6 in the beginning of, chapter, of this chapter, chapter 15. And so the same lesson is coming out. If they accept the word of God, they would be blessed. And if they didn't, then the exact opposite would occur. And so then we have verses 25 to 35, which is the invasion and domination by foreigners. And sure enough, they were invaded by the Babylonians. Come with me to 2nd of Kings and at chapter 17. And we read there in verse 6, In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria, took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halah and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Why, says God? Well, verse 7, For so it was 
that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. Verse 8, they walked in the statutes of the heathen. Verse 9, they did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. Verse 10, they set them up images and groves in every high hill. Verse 11, they burnt incense in all the high places as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. What was the covenant, friends, that they had broken? Well, we spoke of it earlier this evening. It was the Abrahamic promise and Israel had rejected it. And so back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, we come to our next section, which is verses 38 through to 46. And here it is prophesied that when they were back in the land from their captivity, that more troubles would continue. And so they did. And when they did that, they came back into the, um, the uh, city of Jerusalem and they continued to experience troubles. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. And we'll see what was going on as predicted in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we read in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Verse 5. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. And so the whole way through, ladies and gentlemen, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and the prophesy, prophecies prophesied here, they have all come to pass. And so we come to verses 47 to 62. And I want you to look carefully at verse 49. You see, in verse 49 it says, The Lord shall bring thee a nation from the far ends of the earth, now, we believe this to be the nation of Rome, and we'll tell you why. The, na the, 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 the nation of, of Rome was the extremities of the then known world. So that is the first clue that it was the Romans. And then it says that they were as swift as the eagle flieth. And when the Romans went into battle, ladies and gentlemen, they held an ensign with the double-headed eagle. When they went into battle... That ensign is a different one, but they do have an ensign with a double-headed eagle and they go into battle with that. So that's the second clue that it was the Romans. And then it says, A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, or as the margin says, thou shalt not hear. You see, Latin was a language that, whose structure was completely different to the, nation, uh, to, the, to the language of Hebrew. So that is clue number three, that it was the Romans. Now let's have a look at verse 50. It says, A nation of fierce... Well, let's look at verse 49 and carry through. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. And I have here two transparencies of the fierce Roman army. You see, the army was organised with 5,000 legion, legionaries which would form a legion. <coughs> and that legion would be split into centuries of 80 men controlled by a centurion. 
and these centurions would be divided into smaller groups with different jobs to perform. And there was no time out for the Roman soldier. These Roman soldiers had to be physically vigorous. They were expected to march up to 20 miles per day. They had to wear all their armoury and carry their food and tents. And if you said 40 kilos, that's probably being conservative. And it didn't matter whether they were in war or whether they were in peacetime. That's what they had to do. And if they were caught not doing what they were supposed to be doing, there were dire consequences. They were trained to fight well and defend themselves. If the enemy shot arrows at them, they would use their shields to surround their bodies and protect themselves. And the formation was known as a turtle. And you probably see that depiction in some of your history books, Asterix. The Roman army designed battering rams and siege towers to smash into fortifications. And they also developed an early form of large attack catapults. This was a disciplined army. And when you had arrows coming towards you, they just went into this turtle formation and they didn't just take willy-nilly shots. They just protected themselves until they had an opportunity to spear their opponent. They were a disciplined and they were a fierce army and they didn't care who they took out. And a century that did not perform well in battle, even if they won, they might pay the price and be decimated. That means the unit would stand in line and a tenth would be taken out and killed by his own comrades. And the way they did that, when I say a tenth, you had a unit of ten. And they handed out a whole series of straws or sticks, whatever the case. You got the shortest straw, bad luck, guys. And it was your comrades that generally clubbed you to death. They were a fierce army. They were a disciplined army. And if they wanted to set up camp and the, the, the terrain was slightly uneven, they would level it. They would create their camp. And when I talk camp, city with roads. And their generals would be in the middle. And they would do everything to the clock. There would be three alarms. And that army would be on its way. They were disciplined. They would destroy the city behind them as they left so that the enemy could not uh, use the convenience. And what all this is doing, ladies and gentlemen, is showing us that what God says is going to happen, it will happen. But it also proves to us how that prophecies contained in the word of God come to pass exactly as predicted. And so we come to the final section, verses 63 to 68, the dispersion of the Jews. And I want you to have a look at verse 64, because we read there in verse 64 of Deuteronomy chapter 28, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what happened. In AD 70, they were dispersed. Even when you come through to World War II, and they were hunted like dogs by the German army. And they wound up scattered right throughout the earth. But what is to happen next, friends? Well, they are returning to their own country. This nation that was completely wiped out has revived itself again as a nation. And the demographics, when we have a look at the nation of Israel, the population back in 1980, they had a population of 3.9 million people. In 1990, they had a population of 4.8 million people. 2011, 7.74 million people. And today, approximately 8.8 .8 million people. Is that a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen? No. The same force that was behind this nation during the whole of its history is the same force that's going to be behind the nation of Israel, both today 
and in the future. So what is to happen next, friends? Well, Israel is the focus of yet another prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 37, if you would turn there for a moment. Verse 21 we read, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. So this prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, is a three pronged prophecy. Who is the king there? Well, the king is the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a look at the prophecy. And the first prong, if you like, of the prophecy is the restoration of the Jews to their own homeland. And when the Romans took Jerusalem and destroyed its temple, as was prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which we looked at earlier, the Romans then issued a law prohibiting the Jews from returning to their homeland forever. Well, as time went on, the Roman Empire fell, the Muslims took control of Israel, or Palestine as it was then known, and eventually it was governed by Turkey. World War I came and Turkey declared war on Great Britain, Great Britain then attacked Turkey from Egypt and all other parts of the conflict were bitterly contested and Jerusalem fell with them. And so the British government then established the Balfour Declaration which allowed the Jews to return to their homeland and so the prophecy has begun to be partly fulfilled and we can see the latter part of that prophecy being fulfilled there. And it was during the Second World War that the Holocaust was set up Five million Jews lost their lives, but they were not totally annihilated. Why? Because they were a part of the plan and purpose that God has with the earth. This was God's people. I'd like you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 30 for just a moment. And this will explain this in much clearer terms. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 11. And we read, therefore, I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, O Israel, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. That is why Germany did not eradicate the Jews, ladies and gentlemen. God was with them. But God did not do it for Israel's sake. He did it for his own name's sake. And so, continuing on then, in in Ezekiel chapter 37, we read in verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And it was at the end of World War II in 1948, Israel was declared a nation. A nation that had been persecuted for the past 2,000 years and continues, I might add, to be persecuted. Now back in the land, but as a nation. The nation of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and that will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, friends, we can be absolutely certain that Israel is the witness to a true and a living God who is watching over all that is going on in the earth today, that he might ultimately bring about his purpose with the earth, which brings us into this picture. You see, when we come to the plan and purpose that God has with the earth, he not only wants the nation of Israel, but he also wants us, all of mankind, to be a part of that purpose. And how can we do that? Well, 
we can have, we can be baptised into the all-saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are three steps that we need to complete in order to be baptised. And the first is that of belief. We must believe the gospel of the word of God in Galatians chapter 3 and at verse 8. And that's exactly what the nation of Israel didn't do. We must be baptised into the all-saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we must um, be obedient to the commands that God has laid down in this book. We must study the Bible daily. We must worship God in the way that he wants us to worship him, in the way that he has appointed. And ladies and gentlemen, we can be certain that the Jews are witness to the fact that there is a God in the heavens above. We saw how they were the subject of God's plan and purpose with the earth. We saw how that they were subject of a promise made to their father Abraham. We have seen how that they are the subject of a three-pronged prophecy to be completely filled in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, that is the event that we are all looking forward to. That is why we take encouragement when we see these atrocities occurring throughout the earth. And if you want to be a part of the promise that God has made to Abraham, then now is your opportunity to take a hold of that promise, to be baptised and to be part of that wonderful future that is soon to dawn upon the face of the earth. Thank you.